Great. And Sonia, go ahead and uh, mute your camera. All right, I'll start the webinar in five, four, three, two, one. Right, shall we get started? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's event hosted by McDermott and Level 39, discuss, discussing the fintech investment trends. Uh, we have three very fantastic distinguished panelists from the industry who Arvin will introduce shortly. Uh, my name is Amy French. I'm director at Level 39, uh, which is a community of around 180 tech startups and scale-ups in Canary Wharf. Uh, we were launched in 2013 by Canary Wharf Group, and our notable member companies include the likes of Revolut, Digital Shadows, eToro, CybeSafe, and more. Um, and I'll hand over to Arvind to introduce himself and the panelists now. Thank you, Amy. My name is Arvind Abraham. I'm a partner at McDermott Will & Emery, where I lead our UK fintech practice. I'm also very proud to have been part of the Level 39 community since 2015, um, where I've been an investor in several of their startup companies, and act as an informal solicitor in residence. And as Amy mentioned, we're uh, very happy today to be joined by a distinguished panel in the FinTech and venture capital community. We're joined today by um, Jin Jiang, the managing director at APIS, which is a venture and growth capital investment firm where he's responsible for leading their venture capital and scale-up strategies. On the venture side, APIS manages a series of outsourced venture capital funds customized for dedicated corporates and institutions. We're also joined by Kara Boone, who together with Remy Barrett co-leads HSBC's new financial technology venture and growth fund, which she helped establish in 2021 and has extensive experience in making investments and managing portfolio companies. And finally, we're joined by Hussein Kanji, a co-founder and partner at Hoxton Ventures, a venture fund investing across the full spectrum of early stage businesses. Fantastic, really great to have the three of you with us this afternoon. So let's get started. Um, so I guess first focusing on institutional disruption in financial services. I know we'll see the three of you are industry experts in your field. So I think we're gonna dive into specific topics um, that are facing disruption, but it'd also be good to kind of discuss your take on how things have evolved during the pandemic. So Jin, I'm gonna to come to you first. What trends are you currently seeing kind of disrupting the insurance industry and how has that changed during the pandemic? Yeah, thanks Amy, thanks Arvin. So essentially, if you look at an insurance provider or insurer, traditionally they were focused on providing capital as protection, mm -hmm. using capital to, when things happen, they provide protection afterward through capital. I think what's happened uh, over the last few years, which has accelerated over COVID is that they're moving from prevention to preemption and, and basically protecting before. So uh, they're using third party providers uh, through these APIs uh, to onboard them in an ecosystem, which is semi or semi open or fully open to provide solutions that are preemptively helping either individuals or businesses. So this is being facilitated by open banking and open finance on the regulatory side, APIs on the technology side. And as you see in like X as a service business model. Uh, so all this confluence of technology and regulation is helping facilitate this. And uh, during COVID, because of the remote requirement, this acceleration of digital services from third parties integrated into solutions for insurers have accelerated. So that trajectory was already there. It's just something that's been kind of accelerated during that time. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. And so coming to you, Hussein, what about from the kind of back office and compliance side? Is that a similar trend you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we went into a remote type environment, a lot of technology providers had to kind of step up and a lot of companies had to kind of go find these technology providers to make the systems work robustly. I think on compliance, we've been seeing an increasing amount of automation. I mean, it's just it, nobody ever says I want to build 
a world-class compliance team because I'm going to have a competitive advantage in the market because I have the best compliance team in the world. It's, it's largely a cost center. It's something that you have to do in order to be able to run the business. And if you can do that more efficiently without people, that's a good thing. And so up and down the stack, I think we've seen compliance and bits and pieces get automated. The, the challenge with all the automation is there's always a risk that you're not going to be able to provide as good a service as you can with actual people doing some of these activities. And we've even seen this extend out all the way to the consumer. From, uh, you know, So many of us who now consume services, if you were to go open up a challenger bank account, for instance, you know, the authentication and the KYC process is going to be somewhat automated, right? You're probably going to hold the phone up to your face and, and that's how that, it's going to verify your passport against the photo that it kind of sees with the camera. You know, so you're starting to see everything from compliance kind of move all the way, you know, get, get automated and move all the way down to the consumer because it, it just takes cost out of the system. Is there anyone in particular that you think is doing that really well? So here in the UK, Onfido is the big is the big company that's that's there in the crypto space. I think it's Verif is, is the other one that that probably doesn't get as much attention, but is in many ways uh, almost as good, if not a better company than than Onfido. And then in the US, uh, unfortunately, the world gets pretty fragmented. Uh, it's it's ID.me is, is is the big one in, in in the US. I think those are all kind of vying to to go public or become big solid companies, kind of in their own right. And then, you know, behind the scenes on the automation side or on the compliance side, you know, everything from Comply Advantage to Quantexa, both of which are London-based companies, and then one of ours, Behavox, which was a London-based company, has become more of an East Coast type company in the U.S. Um, are, are all doing interesting things. Just one question to probe on that a bit. Do you see any potential for consolidation in this space? So it sounds like right now the companies providing solutions are pretty geographically restricted. Yeah, I mean, and the question, I mean, if you if you if you just take the automation on the KYC AML type stuff or a KYC type stuff, the identities, the identity stuff, you know, they, they are regionally fragmented. And, and I think it's, you know, in, in these kinds of companies, it, they're usually it's just a matter of time before they get consolidated. Unfortunately, I think, you know, you've got two companies, IDME and, and, uh, and Onfita, both of which are trying to go for a public market offering. It's not clear who gets to consolidate who because they're both reasonably sized and there's always some ego uh, around these things that would probably work better together than, than against each other, but they're also in to totally different markets, so they don't actually have to face off in the marketplace. And then I think Verif has kind of carved out a niche in, in, in the crypto space and, and kind of gotten to scale there. So I, I don't, there's not a natural point where you, you see these companies actually coming together. Uh, on the back on the back office type side, on, on the on the Quantexes and the Behavox, you know, a lot of those products are actually quite complementary. Um, most of those companies are doing well, but not exceptionally well the way you would expect, you know, a, a kind of a company that's going to become a $10 billion company to be. And it's, I think that would get a lot stronger if the packages were all kind of linked up together and they were selling kind of a, a more of a platform as a more of a point product. But, but again, you know, the challenge with most is, I mean, it looks good on paper, the ideas sound good on paper, you know, egos and, and personalities and, and leadership kind of usually get in the way of sometimes what is a little bit more rational if you were just looking at it with a clean sheet of paper. Yeah, and that's always the case across industries. Yeah, people don't want to be each other's bosses or probably people want to be the bosses, but people don't want to be each other's employees, <laughs> particularly founders. Cara, coming to you, what are you seeing with HSBC and in the wealth management space? Well, I mean, I don't think it's actually specific to HSBC, but I feel that um, digital and wealth management has been several years uh, coming. And you kind of wonder, like, you know, it seems kind of obvious that, you know, it's something that should be done. I mean, our our own sort of uh, normal banking services have been coming, uh, have been becoming digital uh, over time. But, you know, if you think about it, it takes time to make a transition uh, to digital uh, because wealth is intuitively about protection first and then letting the capital uh, do its thing and grow upon itself. And so it's like, so therefore the intuition is risk averse. And as soon as like somebody's like risk averse or people are risk averse, um, the aversion tilts towards like behavioral inertia. And so to that, like the pandemic was behavioral changing in, in an incredible way because literally you just couldn't go anywhere. I mean, I confess of myself, like, uh, I didn't do online grocery shopping for a while and then 
all of a sudden I did. And yes, you risk having like a, a, a cheese that's moldier in ways that you didn't expect. But, you know, the point being is that, you know, you're willing to accept, um, take the leap. And so um, here it's like, you know, you had a couple of things going on. You had uh, people who suddenly had dis disposable income and, you know, they had uh, opportunity to actually invest. And you have the spectrum of meme stocks and crypto all the way to, um, you know, people planning for big life-changing events. So it could be anything from trading up housing to making retirement decisions, uh, you know, and so on, or even like, unfortunately, death and having to deal with um, with that, which is actually a wealth event for, um, well, generational wealth uh, event. And then, uh, and then you have um, people, again, tied to that, people deciding to make lifestyle, cho lifestyle choices, which is, again, wealth, uh, a wealth changing event and so um, but you need a means of uh, doing that and so with that uh, uh, sort of accelerated need to service people digitally and then you know and then again it's like then also discretionary people deciding okay there are things that I didn't even consider before but are now I think are important to me or important as some sort of value and so I think that uh, people experiencing for example climate issues in their own house, be it flooding or being burnt out of their homes or whatnot, you know, they, they, you know, people either experience it or people observe that in the world. And they're like, you know what, of my capital that I have, and I can invest, I want my utility curve to not just be about financial returns, but also other things. And so, you know, and so it's like, but in order to facilitate all these wants, needs, desire, you know, all these things, you need a way to do that scalably. And um, I'd say of the institutional wealth management space, it's um, it's fragmented. It hasn't, uh, it's been kind of slow to change for the reasons I said about sort of just general feeling of inertia. Um, and then, and now you're putting, you're, you know, all these institutions are now being put in a position where they have to make decisions on how do they uh, service um their clients and customers. And so there it's like, uh, you know, we we're actually starting to see like an acceleration of B2B partnerships where you have uh, institutions working with, um, you know, digital partners uh, in the wealth space to, to basically have an end-to-end -end delivery. And so um, that's, and that I think is uh, a trend that's, um, I mean, people have gotten used to it. I think that they're getting, going to get more of it. And so that, that isn't changing. And so taking into account what you said, Cara, what's what's next? Like everything that's changed over the last two years and that acceleration, what's what are your predictions for next on the horizon? Oh, goodness. Um, it's like it, it's I'll take a small tangent here. It's like I've been watching digital and wealth in Asia for some time. And I think that it's been it's interesting to watch Asia just because it's regionally many countries, many cultures versus you have, you know, the US or even Western countries being more monoculture, meaning in terms of mono behavioral sort of thing. So you can actually get businesses to scale in wealth in North America that couldn't as readily be transportable to Asia. So, you know, you see the discovery process, discovery into let's say robo, and then finally people coming to this I want to have more agency over uh, what I'm doing. So basically, I want to have uh, technology giving me freedom of choice and transparency and all that. And so, you know, I, it's so we have we see a, a number of companies not just per, you know performing the infrastructure of that or a middleware, if you may, sitting on top of general ledgers at financial institutions. You've got you know uh, people providing like let's say ESG and ESG scoring and giving some sort of context for what what sort of decisions you're making. And so, you know, so I just think that there's going to be more of this, um, and it, it's acceptance, right? And so um, uh, I, 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 I would be hard pressed to see how um, you could deny people the ability to, you know, control their own wealth decisions. Incredibly fascinating discussion. Um, and that segues well into another topic, which is also very disruption focused. So how are blockchain and crypto assets changing the financial services landscape? Um, and Jen, we'll start with you. And I think this first question is gonna be a good segue from Card's discussion on FinTech in the wealth management space. So specifically thinking about blockchain and crypto assets, um, do you have any views on their implications for wealth management or asset management? Yeah, sure. Um, so 
I, I want everyone to think from their individual perspective of managing their own money. And then maybe we can extrapolate to businesses, right? So from your perspective, the assets you manage, you're essentially a wealth manager. And then from a business perspective, it's asset management. So it's not just blockchain, but it's a combinatorial of blockchain and smart contracts and a series of other technologies uh, in conjunction with what you call token economics, which is an incentive mechanism layer on top of that. That whole thing drives financialization of everything, right? So if you see a gradient of different assets, so starting with the most digital ones, like digital native skins on games, everyone's easily understanding that. That's already digitized. You can start trading that. But then we go into digital representations of other things like securities or music IP, right? And then we go deeper into the physical realm where it's uh, physical bonded to digital, which is like arts uh, and like real estate. So we go into these gradients and what's happening is all these assets are becoming more easily tradable or exchangeable uh, in a way that, so for example, transaction friction is coming down because uh, the settlement is instantaneous, could be instantaneous, it's more secure, right? the degree and scope of investment opportunity is broadening. And this is because you're seeing accessibility through a fractionalization, right? So you are fractionalizing very big item into small pieces. And then you, you can start composing these assets into structured pieces very easily, right? Uh, digitally, natively. And then there's built-in trust in the, the, the settlement and, and the asset themselves. So it renders the whole industry to become more tradable. Now that doesn't create liquidity, but it is it reduces a good layer of friction and accessibility. And then if you translate this to what I'm quite passionate about in emerging markets is that individuals in frontier markets like Africa or, or in India, they don't have access to a lot of good assets and their wealth gets deflated away or inflated away, right? So you can actually start accessing return proxies through these new assets to preserve your wealth better, more efficiently. And that extrapolates also to businesses. So I find that really fascinating. And one of the themes that I got out of that was this concept of utilization of blockchain and tokenized economics to potentially democratize and help globalize the financial services landscape. So kind of bringing financial services to the underserved in today's um, global playing field. Is that a yeah. fair summation? Of one yeah, of absolutely. So one of the advantages of blockchain, and so it's blockchain, not just blockchain itself, but mm -hmm. other things around it, smart contract or AI. So yeah. basically, Think about uh, why there's issues here. Uh, there's a lot of information asymmetry, right? Between sources of fund and uses of fund, for example. If that information asymmetry goes down because that data is shared among parties that are not trusting before, right? They don't have to go through intermediaries that are inefficient, which is the financial system today, then the cost of capital also goes down or cost of funding goes down. That means on the asset side, people who need those assets also get more affordable uh, cost of basic capital, right? Yeah, 100% agree. So opening up the financial services landscape to those who previously did not have access. Um, okay, so moving on to Hussein, um, I feel like we could dig into all these topics in so much more detail, but given time limitations, so Hussein, what are you most excited about in the blockchain and crypto landscape in terms of use cases or anything else? So I mean, uh, the, we, we've largely, unfortunately, unlike Jin, have sat out the, the, the Web3 economy, um, which is, I think, now how it's a little bit rebranded. And, and I think the easiest thing in the world to have done and, and probably the smartest thing to have done was what you guys have done, which is buy coins um, in, in, those early, in, that, in that early part of the last decade. Um, maybe we wouldn't be here on this panel and be enjoying life somewhere else. 
but I think we all work hard and we, you could have both. Um, you know, I think the chance for us is like, how do you find interesting applications that aren't just replicas of what originally, what already happens, right? So like the, there's, you know, Filecoin is super interesting, but it's effectively like kind of, it's solving a problem that's already been solved. I mean, Dropbox is already there. So I don't think that, or AWS has like a storage layer. I don't think that's particularly compelling. I think the interesting stuff for me is gonna be once this platform actually takes hold, what are the new things that you can build that don't necessarily look like replicas of the old thing, but are truly, really interesting and new. And you don't really know that, right? In the early days of mobile, like you didn't really know what people are gonna do on the mobile phone. You just kind of built the same kind of replicas of what happened on the web. And the same thing happened with the internet in the early days. Um, and before broadband kind of got picked up, and like, you know, you, you did the same stuff. And, and, then, and then you ended up with a bunch of new applications, you know, that kind of get enabled. That's what we're looking for. And that's what we're trying to kind of scratch our heads, you know? NFTs, I think, in many ways, are like a good, interesting new thing. I mean, you know, there's a bit of a there's a bit of speculative mania towards them, but those are things that are fundamentally things that you couldn't do before. Um, and I, I think a bunch of this stuff is going to be this this kind of next generation stuff. I, I wish I had a better system for predicting the future, but my kind of job in life is when smart people kind of come into the office or virtually in the office and kind of explain the future to me, I figure out how to give them a pile of money to let them go make that thing a reality. Um, it's really hard for me to play the role of the entrepreneur and figure this stuff out myself. But thematically, I'm looking for new things that are built on top of this infrastructure versus same old that are built on top of the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, it still feels like we're in such of a um, kind of infancy moment for this industry. So um, my suspicion would be you have not missed out on that web 3.0 boom yet, even if you don't have a mountain of crypto. Yeah. Um, so moving on to Kara. Um, so why don't we tackle this from the perspective of um, how are banks and not necessarily HSBC, but you can speak from um, kind of your personal experience. How are banks kind of generally approaching crypto assets from the perspective of investments for clients? So, so here's the thing. It's like to, to what Jin and Hussein have both been saying. It's like you know, you're talking about enabling economies or um, basically worlds, really uh, ecosystems that haven't existed before. Whereas, like pretty much in the wholesale space, you're kind of dealing with the system that is. And um, and I'd say that you know, crypto is it's challenging because I think that um, you know the the financial ecosystem, uh, and I kind of feel that banks are have turned into a bit of a long arm of uh, the regulatory arms of governments and policies and all and it, because it's really it's a you, you think about it as a it's an extension of the social mechanism and making sure the social contract works, and so um, to you know when you're not 100% absolutely sure that you can control crypto you know it becomes a hard thing to um necessarily accept as being something as bau in you know within a bank and so i think that you know um most organizations will tend towards conservatism around the crypto i mean there's no there's no news there no new news there it's like plenty of people have said in the press you know they're they're sort of like a circumspect views on the other hand they'll be more than happy when there's central bank digital currencies because that's really just more of the same. Now, I mean, th you know, that that said, I mean, that's crypto, but then there's blockchain as applications or uh, DLT as applications for what, you know, potentially improving uh, what we've got. And it's been sort of an interesting journey. I think the headline sort of improvements are relatively well known. I mean, you, I mean, it's really boiling down to efficiency and cost and reduction of operational risk. I mean, like, for example, you know, we can even take the pandemic again. It's like, you know, bad data, you know, generally, I think costs the US financial industry something on the order of three trillion ish a year or some that's sort of like a bit of a, a number that was guesstimated by IBM in terms of like if you've got bad trade information, et cetera. I mean, all sorts of things. You've got capital in the wrong places, you've got to rectify things, you've got lost money or you know, things. It, it's 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 kind of like a, a bit of the the, the if, if you may a, sus a suspense the suspense account of the of the ecosystem it's like when when things go wrong and so naturally like blockchain is 
to automate and alleviate all that. Um, you know, it's like, you know, for example, when things were breaking down during COVID and you had to have reconciliations, I mean, smart contracting and reconciliations is sort of like is, you know, kind of automatically would happen. I mean, that said, I mean, you, this all seems obvious in terms of, you know, what a wonderful world it would be if you adopted all this. But um, as it turns out, implementing new technology into old um, incumbent infrastructures and policies is non-scalable. And I think that's what a lot of companies have found that you know, they're working with banks and fre frequently they'll work with a bunch of banks together, either formally in a consortium or uh, or informally, you know, they're like, OK, we have working groups and, you know, you kind of all have some sort of standards that you kind of uh, coalesce around. But they but in the actual act of, you know, doing integration, you find that this organization had this particular quirk in their firewall, for example, and it's causing, you know, issues with, uh, you know, data flowing or, or whatever it may be. And then you go, you go to the next organization, next organization. And so the networking effects that you would, would have thought would happen if you had, let's say, a third party acting as a bit of a, um, if a hub, if you may, for kind of coordinating all these organizations and upgrading the, uh, the the ecosystems infrastructure it's 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 hard to do and so it, meaning non-scalable so so we'll see I mean like I, I I'm I'm hopeful I just think that you know I uh, that uh, a lot of leaders have come around to the idea that um, stuff like blockchain as sort of a, a a normal thing in in financial institutions it's five years plus sort of yeah. endeavor. So another theme, we've got this great new technology, but embedding it into the legacy plumbing of financial institutions is hard. Yeah, incredibly. Um, which may, which kind of makes you kind of wonder, it's like, uh, you know, the rest of the world, I mean, we could go on into like discussing uh, the de the unbundling <laughs> of, 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 of the financial, uh, financial services. But, um, you know, other people who are a non-banking financial institution, either formally in, in BFI or informally as such, whether they can move faster and do better and service more and bring forward uh, changes. Uh, and 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 this is this is literally a business decision that um, you know the incumbents have to worry about. Like, am I losing business because I can't adapt fast enough? So I'd like to jump into a, a topic that's relatively new quickly for the financial services space, and that's the metaverse. So I'm going to come to you, Jin. Would you mind, for, the, for those in the audience that aren't really aware of what the metaverse is, perhaps you could give us a quick overview from your perspective and also what you see as opportunities or use yeah, cases sure. within financial services? Uh, so I'll put this into context because I think it's a very nebulous term. But I, I think maybe if you could relate to your experiences from the past and then moving forward. So as humans, if you look back after last uh, 10 years, there's an evolution of what we've done. We're spending more and more time into the virtual world, right? It started with when I was a child, played a lot of video games, but then more and more you're, you're doing things on TikTok or YouTube. Right. And then now we have Peloton, you were, we're even exercising right in this virtual world. We're getting more and more immersed. And we fast forward this iteration a few more years. You could think of this progressive path to like the movie uh, Ready Player One. Right. And then the next stage would be like the Matrix. Right. And the next stage would be like the follow deck on Star Trek, right? All of these are same in that you are interconnected in this 3D virtual world, right? But the only difference among the three I just mentioned is the human machine interface, right? The first one is VR and haptic sets. And then the second would be the human brain interface. And I don't know what Star, Star Trek is, but it's, it's, you don't even see it, right? <laughs> But like all of this interconnected experiences, devices, tools, and infrastructure that build that ex experience is part of the metaverse ecosystem or the infrastructure. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Jen. And so how do you see that potentially being used within financial services? So we're already seeing the financialization of some of these assets you see in the virtual world, right? Hussein mentioned these NFTs. These are virtual lands or virtual IPs like music that's already being traded. Increasingly, you're going to see combination of real world assets being combined with virtual world services and actually being sold, right? So there's no limit to creativity, uh, but I think the financialization of these assets and how it's being used in the virtual world will become uh, the most, uh, the, the spearhead. And I see this, especially in Asia where the gaming culture is quite advanced. People are already very in tune with uh, using these uh, assets in the virtual world. You know, it's fascinating that you bring up that interplay between the real world and the virtual world. Um, we have seen some and kind of preliminary client inquiries about, you know, tokenizing real estate, for instance, and selling that NFT representation of real estate. So it is effectively selling the title to whatever property, but doing it as a token sale as opposed to a traditional real estate sale. Um, and, you know, I can only imagine that there's going to be more iterations of that type of transactional activity in the future. Well, you, you are, so that, that's the layer, like the first stage, right? You're tokenizing, but you actually start fractionalizing for the people who cannot buy the whole, uh, you know, like penthouse on Mayfair, for example, right? So you start fractionalizing these things and then you put it into a virtual world, which is a mirror digital twin. And then you start combining other services on top for a virtual uh, party or whatever, right? So there's no limit. So the, the, the crazy part is, is uh, you know, Amazon and when they came in with the internet, you had, you could say potentially infinite amount of inventory, right? Vir like storefronts. So the, the design space in the virtual world in the 3D is infinite. It's even more, it's crazier, right? Basically, yeah, so it, it's, it's uh, the, I think what you have to figure out is how to deal with scarcity uh, and, and understanding valuation of these things because that's what we're seeing in NFT right now, right? We're seeing explosion of this, but it's not controlled. There's a really interesting angle to that also. Um, where right now there's a perceived sense of scarcity on some of these metaverse platforms, so Decentraland, Sandbox, et cetera, where some of these kind of virtual lands are selling for millions of dollars plus, right? Yet in theory, you know, the makers of the platform can produce as much of this virtual land as they want, right? And the concepts of, you know, a luxury neighborhood versus a not so good neighborhood, does that really exist in a fictitious world where you can get from point A to point B instantaneously? So you'd have to manufacture some of these elements or kind of hard code some element of scarcity into the model. Um, all of which, you know, these are fascinating concepts to think about. It could be a role, for, it could be a role for uh, investment bank in, in the virtual world where they, they do the crypto economics of these real estate to see, okay, you can't create more, otherwise your whole franchise falls apart, right? I was gonna say the natural scarcity is where all the people are hanging out. So you could create infinite worlds from a tech perspective, but you know, if, no, if they don't attract any people, those are not particularly attractive places to be. And that's kind of usually the same, even in the physical world. You kind of want to be where the where the people are and where the right people are. That's what puts a premium on, on, on prices. And right now, it seems like the place to be in the metaverse is around Snoop's house <laughs> in the sandbox. I mean, Hussein, you bring up a great point about being where people are at is like, and that's defining the scarcity. And so it's a, uh, I thought it was hilarious when like McDonald's, like they file like 10 trademark applications, you know, for like stuff they're doing in the metaverse. And that's like everything from having a virtual restaurant to like, you know, you can like order your Mickey D's and actually get it in, uh, in your house while you're hanging out, like, you know, and, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, you think about like the, the origins of like money, where did money come from? It's like two people met each other, they traded stuff. And then eventually they're like, oh, this is a little bit too heavy to carry. I need a thing that like, you know, represents value. 
and then uh, and then it kind of goes on and on. But you know, it's like, but yeah, it's it's again that sort of like behavior just manifested somewhere else and this is now just so in a way the metaverse or at least the way that we're understanding the metaverse right now is 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 a bit of the same but in any case it's it's pretty cool <laughs> but do you think it's kind of and actually going back to that kind of mcdonald's case study there do you think it is all kind or not maybe all but partially hype versus what is actually realistically going to happen what do you think you know, it's 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 hard to tell about hypes. I think hype cycles are in general are like, you're right. It's like you know everybody gets excited, no idea how to price the hype, and then and then something maybe disastrous happens, and some enthusiasm like just deflates the the hype, and then it kind of like, uh, you know, then you know there's some sort of maturity in the understanding, and it comes back. What is that like? It's like the cycle of like euphoria, and then like doom, and then it comes back to something that's a bit more normal. Um, you know, it, it feels like it's kind of the same ish again, sort of pattern. So meaning, so I guess your question really is like, does it all just blow up and go away? Probably not. I mean, we look at how we, you know, people like text each other when they're sitting around the table and they have a chuckle, you know, it's like the fact that we've already like are there with our phones kind of like leads you to believe that we've kind of permanently changed how we've, uh, you know, how we engage with other people and it feels natural. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, the, Gar the, Gartner, the Gartner hype cycle is the is the one where it kind of goes up and down and up and up, up again. Hussein, yeah. how do you think it will kind of just impact financial services as a landscape? I, I'm I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I I fall into the a lot of this stuff is the 99 percent 99 percent hype, one percent substance. To me, to me, the metaverse in its current state is is Club Penguin 2.0. And people don't remember Club Penguin uh, unless there were kids growing up or, or maybe Second Life. It's a, it's a bad idea that keeps manifesting itself every 10 years and doesn't go anywhere. And in, intrinsically, I think it ends up getting deprecated because the tech platforms that we use today are very different than tech platforms we used 10 years ago. And I'm pretty sure the tech platforms that we use 10 years or 20 years from now are going to be very different, which means you build an entirely different thing. So even if the thing today has legs, it's not going to be the same thing that kind of goes the distance. That's, that's just a, my general observation on it. In, in terms of financial services, I think anytime, and, and there's lots of literature on this in the, in the academy, anytime there's a new thing like this, there's a, there's a wave of money that goes in. It's, it's mostly speculative because it moves the market up because there's a rush of money coming in. It tends to attract even more money. So I, I think it's a great wealth it's it's a great wealth tax uh, that's undis that's that's not so that's kind of disguised because a bunch of dumb money kind of goes in and will eventually kind of wipe itself out and kind of go away. So it's kind of a tax on it's a tax on people who understand who think they understand innovation but probably don't really understand innovation. There's a question there also where on the Gartner curve we are right. So we're probably in that hype cycle of extreme euphoria, you know, new technology, it's incredibly cool. Is it really that different from a video game like Roblox right now? No, not really. So we're at the very infancy of this technology, which may or may not take off and it may become real virtual worlds like the matrix, or it may stay kind of video game-esque. It's right? not even ready player. Know. It's not even at the level of ready player one yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, it's the precondition of this uh, immersion, that immersion experience, and the the experience you get is is you get to like uh, you know in terms of communication, there's no latency, right? That's why you, we don't have massive online game real time because it's really hard right now to do this. Five years forward, that's possible because the game studios are working on that, and we we have 5G by then. And then, like the computing, that uh, the computing ability to generate uh, content, or like if you design content, you can actually manifest it. That takes computing, so that has to be up to speed. All these things have to be at the right time to, for this to manifest in a. But well, we, we, it's very hard to say when, but it will happen. Uh, what we do on the blockchain layer, which is like what you call the Web three. The blockchain layer is the settlement layer, really, right? Instead of having uh, something you tie to the banks, it's really natively in the internet and you just settle in it. Yeah. So it sounds like there's a couple of components to this, right? So, you know, you're referencing a hardware component. We're not there yet. 
a software component. We're probably not there yet. And then there's a contracting or digitally native contracting component, which is also in its infancy via blockchain, blockchain and smart contracts. So all of these kind of building blocks of this new Ready Player One matrix experience, what have you, they're all kind of nascent still. Yet yeah, the entire thing is very it's native, But if you're in gaming, I think you would be the first point of contact for that because they're happy with a, a lower hurdle, right? So that's where I think the disruption happens. Okay. Well, why don't we move on to our next topic and then we'll save the last 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, so this is one um, which I've had conversations with most of you about in the past, um, but um, I think very useful for the entire audience to hear it, particularly given the recent events um, geopolitically. So what do all of you think about the current state of the economy? Are we in a bubble? And if so, how can investors and startup founders react to that? So maybe, why don't we start with you, Cara? Yeah, so I mean, I guess the, um... I guess the idea that you know I was thinking about, at least with respect to venture, is that it's we're talking about pockets of risk appetite and how much money can go to these pockets. And so, um, I mean, it, it's we we kind of all kind of know that it's like the most liquid space in the world is obviously listed stuff, and even fixed income is bigger than equities and that. And even then, real estate is even bigger than like all these like securitized elements. And then you go down in the curve into private assets and all the way down at the, you know, sort of a other end of the risk curve is like where we are, which is, um, which is venture. And I think that, you know, over the past, you know, two decades, people have seen the, you know, massive multiples of returns you can get um, by basically cruising the elevator, the escalator of like technology and having that, you know, things kind of uh, evolve and then they become public companies and then boom you know you, you it's it's an it's a new thing in the in the index in an index and you know all that way it's like people see the success that's come around and, and they kind of forget anything for that you can just kind of sit there and cruise on that escalator that's what a lot of people want to do i mean like and they kind of and then here's the thing it's like in a in a portfolio you know sort of construction you allocate some money for like tail risk. You're like, okay, well, I'm not quite sure, you know, what's going to happen, but I do know stuff happens. And so I better have some money in there. And, you know, and then so that, yes, when things happen, it's like in a basket, something will do great and then carry that entire allocation up. And then it's a long-term strategy. And so, and that's great. I mean, like there's only, you know, but, but there's only so much money that early stage companies can take because literally they just started. It's not like you could throw, you know, a billion dollars on day day one uh, and, you know, and and things will happen. It just doesn't work like that. And so, um, you know, and, and you, you, just, you also need to get paid a risk premium for taking, you know, that, dollar of risk early on in a company's life where you don't even know what's going to happen. So, um, you know, and so, so people kind of like, you know, need to put in context, you know, dollar and risk adjusted dollar. And so the thing that I kind of worry a lot about is that, oh, well, do we have a lot of money, you know, now flooding venture and going down into early stage venture because it looks sexy. And frankly, it actually is a logical thing to do because, Per the portfolio construction, yeah, you do want, you know, money, you know, you do want money there because stuff happens. Um, it, but it does, it, it's, it's, it's just generally challenging for valuations because, you know, more money just means more competition and, um, and sort of like, you know, you kind of see bad things happen to companies when they kind of price it, price around, it's too high and they run out of cash and then you, then you don't know what to do for your, you know, in your next round, everybody hates a down round. And, and so, you know, I, I mean, so in other words, I'm not worried so much about a scarcity of money in, in a particular pocket, no matter what, you know, if like, yes, I know the bad stuff will happen in the world, geopolitics, for example, you know, valuations go up and down, but, uh, but for the now, right now, um, you know, it's a, it's just kind of money flows uh, is, is what I th think a lot about. So you don't think we're going to have a contraction in the money flows into startup companies or new funds trying to raise capital um, if anything blows up in the next couple of months or year, year and a half? 
Well, Jin actually had some good, like, <laughs> sort of like further <laughs> differentiation of what does it actually mean? And like, let's say, you know, in, in what market? So I'm going to pass the baton to you actually to comment on that. Uh, thanks, Kara. <laughs> um, so I think if you look at things in, in terms of bubble, right? People look at like the Warren Buffett indicator to see, are we in a bubble or not? And I think the, the reality is, uh, this is my opinion, like not APIS's opinion or anyone else's opinion. Uh, we've gone through uh, 40 years of structural int interest rate downwind, which meant all the multiples on all assets have increased across all geographies, right? Having said that, and we're seeing at the height of the Buffett like point, in real terms, because the central banks have printed so much more money, it's not as bad as it looks on the Buffett indicator. So the crazy thing is, is this could continue for a long time, but the, it, it has to end somewhere. But we're not as bad as we think we are, right? So, because the system is flush with so much more liquidity. So yeah, even if there's, indices if are have, higher, it's kind of partly being propped up by new money. If there's 30%, 40% more dollars this year than last year, and then 20%, 25% before that, then that dollar is worth that much less in real terms, right? Mm -hmm. So nominally, it looks really bad. But in real terms, it's it's actually asset prices and and, you know, like equities or private equity or venture, they've, they've actually uh, adapted pricing quite well. Now, I think there's a reflexivity to this, right? So the more you pump money in, the faster you grow. And, and there's sometimes more cash flow amongst the, the growth companies. Uh, so when the tap goes down for some reason, that's when things get ugly. And it would be, yeah, I mean, I, I think if you are a, at a venture investor, you're gonna be hit uh, quite a lot because actually it's gonna cascade down to you also. We're not immune here. Um, fortunately, the valuation at the earlier stage or mid-stage venture haven't re-rated as much as late stage pre-IPO growth capital uh, or listed companies. So it's relatively better. But if I'm a, an investor uh, and, and, and a lot of the invest institutional firms are seeking basically return because there's no yield anywhere, right? So it's going down to the risk curve to venture. Uh, I mean, risk adjusted venture is still attractive. Uh, you just have to pick the right funds and uh, because I, I think, what, what are we paying for? We're paying for uh, growth and dura durable growth, right? Mm -hmm. on, on companies that will disrupt the industries. So you're betting on the right part of circular curve and they have a long runway. So it could be more forgiving in terms of valuation because they'll compound their way out. But if you're at, at the public stage, your base is so much higher. So it's that compounding will be much lower, obviously, right? But I, obviously at the earlier stage, there's more risk. So you kind of have to understand what part of the risk curve you want to come in in the venture stage. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the things that you're teasing out here is that on a relative basis, valuations are probably better at the early stage level um, of the investment market than it would be in the public markets. Is that fair to say? So perhaps if there is some sort of blow up, you know, the early stage market is gonna be less impacted. With that said, and Hussein turning to you for the last question for this topic. Arvin, I didn't say that it's gonna be less affected. Okay. Everyone will be affected, but you can get your returns, uh, recoup, recoup your returns more relatively better, I think. So from an investor's perspective, right? If you're looking to invest in an asset class that will be relatively less impacted. So not necessarily from the founder's perspective, um, but from an investor's perspective, if you're looking It'll at- It'll compound market, its way out. It'll compound its yeah. way out. Fair enough. Now, Hussein, question for you. 
Um, so say you're advising one of the founders of your portfolio companies, and hypothetically, we're going into a cycle with some form of retrenchment coming, would you be advising them to batten down the hatches and be a bit more careful in spending or growth projections? Or are you saying, you know, treat it like normal full steam ahead? How are you dealing with uh, the situation? Yeah, so so I, I'm I'm less convinced than Jen, I guess, on 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 valuations on the early stage. I mean, we're seeing people pay ridiculous premia, even even to this day, you know, a hundred x revenue. And you're right, you can compound your way out of the hundred x revenue and you can grow into the multiple as a young company. So you can certainly do that, but the return may not actually be all that great because even if you compound your way, you might still end up leading to kind of a two x if you massively overpaid. You know, at the inception, so you still make you 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 know you can still make money if the company is high quality, but it's you might be paying a big premium. And I think you know that there's a huge disconnect between the public markets and the private markets. You know, you can buy a growing company at 40% revenue. That's a that's a trillion dollar business, i.e., Apple or Microsoft, and pay a fraction of the multiple for something. And you know, 40% growth is is no joke. So so there's there's a bit of a disconnect. In, in this, and yes, you can grow your way out of these problems, but you still massively overpay. So, what's the, the the net effect of this? Is what do you do if you're if you're a venture firm kind of advising your companies? You know, I, I would take as much cash off the table as possible today. Like, if you can get these rounds, you know, I would take them. I wouldn't use the cash, so I would not spend your way to the point where you're subservient to the cash. So you have to go get kind of, kind of the next shot of capital in order to build a real company. But if you can go raise at 100x. Um, in terms of valuation, and you can stockpile 10, 20, 50 million bucks in the bank, you, yeah. you should go do that. And that's, the, that's the best way to kind of build a bit of resilience in, in, into this market. You know, I don't know when the music's going to stop. It feels like it ought to stop, but there are lots of reasons why I don't think it's going to. One of the biggest reasons is, is, is that, and, and the UK is a great example of this, is the UK can't raise rates, otherwise the UK itself goes insolvent. It needs the rates to be really low. Like we printed so much cash in the UK to subsidize things that we need interest rates to stay where they are. If they hike up to four, five, six percent, you know, the, the UK has some serious fiscal trouble ahead of it. So there's and the same thing for and, the US. It's and the same thing for the US. We used to have independent central banks that were disconnected from politics. We no longer have this. So, you know, it's in the politicians' interest to keep rates low. But, you know, this is this is kind of delaying the inevitable. So I do think at some point there's going to be some kind of correction. I have no idea how to predict it, but but I do think it's probably healthier for companies to spend less than what they have on their balance sheet and to take a more modest view, um, you know, on, on on kind of cash reserves. So be conservative, but it's not necessarily all doom and gloom yet. No, I think you can get a lot of money, just don't spend it. And this is all speculating, right? So we have no idea what's going to happen in the next uh, several months, let alone year to years time from now. Yeah. And the more you can ride out the storm as a young company or as a middle stage company, the better, right? If there is a storm. And ideally, there's no storm at all because it's all happy days and it keeps going up and to the right. But, you know, you want to be able to weather these kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, if there is a storm, I'm moving to the metaverse. So. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note of the metaverse, we have a question in the Q&A, um, which actually is a reminder to everyone that is currently online. If you do have some questions, please do put them in the Q&A and we will try and come to them. But one of the questions we have is, how is the metaverse different from something like Second Life, i.e. is it more sustainable? What are the differences? Does it, anyone want to tackle that one? I'm not so sure it's all that different other than it, 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 these days it attracts the attention of a lot more people. And again, if the people kind of show up in bulk, you know, it's, it's, it's Second Life with better graphics, but much more mainstream. And if it becomes really, truly mainstream, then it's much more interesting. Jin, do you want to touch on that one too? You were mentioning some tie-ins to the real world economy. Yeah, I, so I, I think um, I, I think the you know like if you had there were uh, technologies created before their times, right? Uh, and I think Second Life is kind of like that. Like you had other iterations of e money also before their times. Uh, but it never took off. I think there's more um, this 
like Hussein said, more ecosystem being built around this. And, and it's being led in uh, not necessarily as, as much. I, I know Facebook is trying to do this, but like in Asia already Tencent and some of the other companies are pushing this as their strategic agenda, right? So you have a lot of big companies with a lot of resources investing, and they've also started investing, you know, uh, the like the Tencent guys have invested in a lot of Western animation companies or um, and like infrastructure. So it's more than like one company it takes a, like a whole village. And I think we're, the village is starting to pop up in different parts of the world. So just reminding the audience, um, we probably have time for one more question. So if anyone has anything to ask, please feel free to uh, type it in the chat. Sorry, Cara, I didn't mean to cut you off. I actually had a question for Jin, because like not to get like totally ageist, but you know, is it potentially that again to your to your point earlier, Second Life happened at a point in time that maybe the right kind of demographics wasn't there. You know, do things change now? Do we have to wait for another generation, you know, to happen where we have, I don't know, Second Life version three or something like that? Um, I don't know. I, I I wonder about that a lot. Like, you know, when is the world ready for a concept? Uh, I don't know if I can answer that question. Uh, I think, you know, I, I'm a bit older, uh, but seeing what the Gen Z is doing, uh, especially in Asia in the Far East with the gaming, they're natively already immersed quite a bit and they use assets in, in the games very naturally. And so to the extent that if we extrapolate some of the experiences and content, right? I think it, we're kind of at that inflection point. I don't think it's the same case in the US. I, I, I think it's a different type of mentality actually. Amy, do you want to take the next question? I was unhappy to. Yeah, sure. Um, this one, perhaps we'll come to Cara for this one. Uh, how can traditional investment banks stay competitive in the face of fintech developments? Okay, well, um, it's like not, not just HSBC, a lot of other banks as well. It's like, I think that there was again, a cycle of acceptance. And so uh, first I think that, you know, you get people who are thinking, oh my goodness, this is competing with my own business. For example, I mean, Amy, you mentioned Revolut, right? It's like, you know, the question is, oh, it's competing with my payments business, this is evil. And so, um, and then, so people almost like in a denial of, you know, these these upcoming uh, sort of companies. And then, and then as it turns out, you know, Revolut is occupying a space that doesn't that overlaps, but doesn't necessarily intermediate or disintermediate uh, the financial institutions. And so, um, you know, over the years, I think uh, they've come around to the idea that okay, well, um, you might actually have to partner with these uh, companies in order to mutually get what you want. I mean, clearly, they need to have cust clients. They need to make revenues. You know, you need to upgrade your um, technology just to to get with it. And it's very expensive to actually do this in house and to be able not only to, um, you know, just build it, but also to maintain it. And then if you have a third party who becomes a specialist at X, you know, they get economies of scale at doing X. It's like, it's kind of like why you hire consultants, right? They see patterns of the same sort of thing and they service like, you know, various institutions, not just yours exclusively. And so, um, you know, it's like, so there's definitely a, a B2B partnership model that's going around, uh, at, at all levels of big global financial institutions to, you know, whatever tier twos and threes. The question really is, it's like, you know, can you, um, can you make good use of your partnership? And that's where I think that, you know, um, organizations are at varying levels of sort of, a, um, you know, um, I, I guess, togetherness with their partners, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, it takes a lot of investment. It also takes political energy to say, um, I've put my chips with this external party to make something happen for us. And that's and that's kind of frightening. I mean, you think about it, it's like, you know, banks kind of go through a bit of a three-year cycle of life. You know, it's like, it's sort of like the cadence of, of, of the universe. And three years, though, is not really 
that much time and you have to meet you know quarterly expectations for revenues etc so it's very hard for um people to you know stick their necks out for for that and so you know uh, you know they it's it's an evolving thing it's like you know uh, it's the sort of like cost pressures what do i do with it technology how do i you know deal with it um uh you know it's but again fruitful opportunity for 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 up and comings so that's all the time that we have for today such a fascinating discussion and i feel like we could spend hours more talking about all the stuff and i will with most of you <laughs> um but thank you all so much for your time today um and for you know taking the time out of your busy schedules to discuss with the audience um and for all those on the um, on the Zoom connection, if you have other questions for Amy, myself, or any of our panelists, feel free to uh, get in touch by email. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.